Good evening. I'm Joe Nye, Dean of the Kennedy School, and it's an honor to welcome you tonight to the inauguration of the John Sawhill Lectureship and the John Sawhill Lecture. Uh, John Sawhill was a quite remarkable man. Uh, I'll say a word about him, but I would say that we're particularly honored to have as the first John Sawhill Lecturer, uh, Theo Kaniatu, who is a already a faculty member at the Kennedy School, but a uh, very distinguished uh, uh, professor of economics with a long dedication to the environment. And as the John Sawhill lecturer uh, tonight, uh, Professor E.O. Wilson, who has a most distinguished career in this area. Uh, John Sawhill was a man who uh, was a multiple threat uh, in the sense that he had succeeded in business, nonprofits, government, and academia. In that sense, I've often thought of him as a model of the kind of leader that we tried to train here at the Kennedy School. He was comfortable working across all different sectors. He kept a clear eye on one thing, which is how to make the world a better place, no matter which sector he was working from. John was a dedicated environmentalist through his life, and at the time of his death in May 2000, he was the president and CEO of the Nature Conservancy, which he joined in 1990. And under John's leadership, that organization became the world's largest private conservation group, protected more than 7 million acres of land in the United States alone, and was in the process of becoming a global organization. John taught a course at the business school which was in the area of social enterprise, which he called effective leadership of social enterprises or nonprofits, in which he tried to prepare students for nonprofit management. Before that, from 1981 to 1990, John had been a director of McKinsey and Company, where he headed the firm's energy consulting practice. And prior to that, he was deputy secretary of the Department of Energy in the Carter administration and before that had been the uh, head of the Energy Administration in the Ford Administration, where he was fired uh, by President Ford for suggesting that a gasoline tax might be a wise policy investment, starting a long American tradition. Uh, but John was never afraid to speak up for what he thought was right, and he managed to maintain that throughout his life and through his different careers. He was president of New York University, a graduate of the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, and uh, had his PhD in economics from NYU. He was a man who tragically was taken from us well before his life's accomplishment were completed. He had much more to give, but he was a man who in his life set an example for all of us of what it means to be a leader across sectors, what I call a multi-sectoral entrepreneur, dedicated to making the world a better place. And we can't have better people to honor him tonight than Theo Paniatu, the first incumbent of his lectureship, and Ed Wilson, who will give the lecture tonight. Uh, we're also very fortunate to have as the moderator of our panel tonight, after uh, Professor Wilson's lecture, Calestis Juma, a member of the Kennedy School faculty, a professor of practice, who is a distinguished academic and a distinguished practitioner, having worked uh, both in academia and in the United Nations and in nonprofits. Um, Calestis is a man who Kofi Annan turns to when he wants to know what to do about uh, issues of sustainable development. He has just come back from Johannesburg at the Conference of Sustainable Development, uh, a man of great wisdom and great knowledge, and our moderator this evening. Please welcome Lestis Juma. Thank you, Joe, for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm honored this evening to welcome you all to this forum event. Uh, I am particularly pleased that we have, as our first speaker this evening, E.O. Wilson, who has 
really been a, an inspiring light in the field of biological diversity. And he's currently our university research professor and honorary curate of the entomology at the Museum of Comparative Zoology. He has spent a considerable amount of time not only trying to understand how the natural world works, but also relating it to the social world as well. Uh, in his work, he has been instrumental in inspiring a tremendous amount of research that has contributed significantly to our ability to understand and act on our relationship uh, with the environment. His works, which cover both the social and the natural sciences, have become a basis for extensive policy discussions and have had significant impact on the way the international community thinks about the conservation of biological diversity. It's a, his work is a remarkable collection of ideas uh, that have been expressed in his books in a very articulate and a clear way. And he's one of the very few people who have really been able to bring the world of scholarship and the world of public action together largely through his ability to express complex issues in ways that, in fact, the public uh, can understand. Uh, I believe that E.O. Wilson he is the most admired scientist in the world today. And because of that, he has been very instrumental in keeping in the public consciousness the importance of protecting life on Earth. Uh, and particularly helping us to think through the significance of recognizing the linkages that we have uh, with the natural environment. And I'm so pleased tonight to present to you Professor E. Wilson. Professor Juma, Galestis, Dean Nye, Dr. Val, Dr. Johnson. John Stallhill put uh, the, uh, the whole issue as neatly as possible when he said that uh, a society is defined not just by what it creates, by what, but by what it refuses to destroy. I'd like to put the question then uh, of the evening this way. In this densely economic, political, religion-saturated worldview that dominates our lives in the 21st century. What have we overlooked about our place in history? What are we neglecting at the risk of forever losing? And the answer, most likely to be clear 100 years from now, and probably sooner, is much of the rest of life, the creation, if you prefer, a lot of our environmental security, which underlies all other forms of security, and just as important part of what it means to be human. Our relation to the rest of life can be put in a nutshell as follows. Scientists have found the biosphere to be far richer than ever before conceived just in the last couple of decades. That biodiversity, which took over three billion years to evolve, is being eroded at an accelerating rate by human activity. And that loss will inflict a heavy price in wealth, security, and spirit. The bottom line in global economics, if I may be so bold as to wander this far afield, is different from that generally assumed by our leading economists and political philosophers. They've largely ignored the numbers that count. Consider the following. With the world population past 6 billion and on its way to 8 or 10 billion or more by late century before peaking and starting to descend, per capita freshwater and arable land are dropping to levels that resource experts agree are very risky. The key statistic is the ecological footprint, which is the average amount of productive land and coastal marine environment appropriated by each person, not in a single block, for example, where you might live in Massachusetts or Texas, but in bits and pieces from around the world needed 
for food, water, housing, energy, transport, commerce, and waste management. Each person, for example, draws down a little bit of Costa Rica, for coffee, a little bit of Saudi Arabia, for oil, and so on. In a developing world with five billion of the six billion people, the ecological footprint is about two and a half acres. In the United States, it is 10 times that much, about 24 acres. For every person in the world today to reach present American levels of consumption with existing techno technology would require four more planet Earths. Let me repeat that. For everyone to live like Americans would require four more planet Earths. The people of the developing world may never want to attain our level of profligacy, but in just trying to achieve a decent standard of living, they've joined the industrial world in converting the last of the natural environments and reducing a large part of the planet's fauna and flora to endangered station status or final extinction. Our unbalanced relation to the natural world began, I would like to suggest, a long time ago as a mistake in capital investment. Humanity, having appropriated the Earth's natural resources during the Neolithic Revolution, starting about 10,000 years ago, chose to annuitize the resources with a short-term maturity reached by progressively increasing payouts. At the time, it seemed a wise decision. And viewed in the short term, it still does. After all, the result is rising per capita production and consumption worldwide, markets awash in oil and grain, and a surplus of optimistic and environmentally innocent economists monitoring GDPs and competitive indices. But there is a problem. The key elements of natural capital, in other words, Earth's arable land, groundwater, forest, marine fisheries, and petroleum are finite and not subject to proportionate capital growth. They are furthermore being decapitalized by overharvesting and habitat destruction. Therefore, with population and consumption continuing to increase up and up, the per capita amounts of resources left to be harvested are falling and destined to do so at a faster, faster pace in the future. Altogether, the 21st century is destined, in my opinion, to be called the century of the environment. The immediate future is usefully conceived as a bottleneck. Science and technology, combined with a lack of self-understanding and a paleolithic obstinacy that led to our ruinous environmental practices have brought us to where we are today. Now science and technology, combined with foresight and moral courage, both based on a more enlightened ethic, has to see it through through the bottleneck and out, one hopes, by the end of the century. The, sec the uh, collateral result of overpopulation and poor environmental management, and the one to which I've personally paid a great deal of attention, is the accelerating destruction of the natural environment, leading to the mass extinction of ecosystems and species. The Damage already done can't be repaired within any, within any period of time that has meaning for the human mind. The more it is allowed to grow, the more human generations will suffer for it in ways both well understood now and still unimagined. Why, they will ask, future generations will ask, by needlessly, needlessly extinguishing the lives of other species, you diminished our own. The radical reduction of the world's biodiversity is the folly our descendants will least likely forgive us. So let me review very briefly some of the basic facts about global biodiversity. Biodiversity, biological diversity for short. What is it? It is the creation, if you prefer. It is all the heritable variation in life on Earth. From ecosystems like marshes, ponds, uh, rivers, forests, uh, to the next level, the species that compose the ecosystem, to the lowest level, the genes and the variant genes that compose the species. Where is biodiversity located? Everywhere there is liquid water, or the potential of liquid water, pole to pole from the peak of Everest to the Challenger Deep at 36,000 feet below the ocean surface. At least there are bacteria and other microorganisms, some of which also thrive in various places in water above the boiling point in the thermal vents of the ocean floor. 
super cold water of the Antarctic ice and two or miles or more below the Earth's surface, uh, drawing energy from the metabolism of inorganic uh, chemicals. These are the famous slimes. Uh, subterranean litho-autotrophic uh, microbial ecosystems. Yes, that will be on the agenda. Uh, now, most of the species are uh, in the tropical rainforest, covering about 6% of the Earth's land surface. That's down by about half of what it was before humanity came along. This richest of the world's natural environment and natural environments of all kinds around the world, without exception, are shrinking rapidly. And we know what that effect alone has on the diversity of life as measured in numbers of species. It is this. The number of species as an area that declines drops by a third to six root of the area diminished. This means, in simple rule of thumb, when you drop the area by 10 to 10 percent, as occurred, you know, around the world, Madagascar, the Atlantic forests of Brazil, um, the Philippines, many places, to 10 percent of where it is, you are destined to lose half of the species, and relatively soon. And we know, in many cases, how soon that will go, how that will occur, down to that 50 percent level. The tropical rainforests are disappearing worldwide at a rate of half a percent to one percent per year. The remaining cover of tropical rainforests is about equal to the coterminous 48 states, and the rate of destruction is equal to half or all of the state of Florida each year. This translates to as much as a quarter of one percent of the species extinguished right away or doomed to early extinction, or as we say, committed to extinction. Um, now, the other uh, factors that have been brought uh, to uh, intense levels by human beings can all be summarized by the, uh, by the acronym HIPPO, HIPPO, like the animal. Yeah. And you go down the letters in order of their importance. Habitat, H for habitat destruction, I for invasive species, like the innocent looking purple loose strife, or the tiger, mosquito, or the fire ant, or the uh, omnivorous uh, bird-eating brown snake, and so on. At any rate, P is for, the first P is for pollution. P is, the second P is for overpopulation. We have to throw that in because, you know, that's root, that's basic. And we just stick it in there. O is for over-harvesting, hippo. I'll close with a dispatch from the Global Biodiversity Front to tell you a little of what is being done about the hemorrhaging of these ecosystems and species and how the problem can be solved. First, it turns out that large blocks of the last remaining natural environment, and especially the tropical wilderness areas, where so much of the diversity is still holding on, can be preserved at surprisingly low cost and in such a way as to yield greater profit to the countries owning them. It's as simple as this. Logging companies are operating on a very thin profit margin. They can be outcompeted by conservation groups using private gifts, which are then leveraged by grants from the Global Environment Fund, World Bank, and in some case, governments. For as little as $10 an acre and often less, conservation concessions can be established in which countries otherwise prepared to make logging concessions turn to preserve the forests themselves or the logging rights can be purchased in some cases for as little as two or three dollars an acre, or the land can be purchased outright. By these means, two organizations alone, Conservation International and the Nature Conservancy, have already added over two million acres to the parks and reserves of Bolivia, Guyana, and Suriname. They're also, and this is important, because you cannot, as was just said, uh, you cannot uh, deal with conservation sensibly without dealing with economic development and growth. They are also offering research and management expertise to promote the use of this land. You have, you have a higher sustainable yield from tourism, carbon credits, and other non-invasive income sources that would be more profitable than timber leases and agricultural 
conversions. Other developing countries around the world are lining up to see if they can work an arrangement such as this. Because it is easy, surprisingly easy, to draw important new income from natural areas if you use ingenuity, investment, uh, capital, and uh, the right kind of uh, expertise. Another point of uh, entry is the preservation of hotspots, those particular forests, coral reefs, and other local habitats that are both endangered and contain the largest number of plants and animals found nowhere else. Just 25 of the terrestrial hotspots cover covering only about one and a half percent of the land or the exclusive homes and an astonishing 44 percent of all of the known species of vascular plants, for example, and 36 percent of the uh, birds and reptiles and amphibians. Right now it is uh, the private sector working through environmental, non-governmental organizations that forms a spearhead. But it will have to be governments that move in behind and accomplish uh, this uh, great goal. Uh, they still do the heavy lifting. We spend $6 billion a year worldwide on all kinds of conservation, and that is uh, chump change, and that can be easily improved. A recent estimate suggests that about $28 billion in one payment could secure the 25 hottest hotspots and most of the core areas of the tropical forest wilderness in the Amazon, Congo, and New Guinea. That's 28 billion, and it's worth keeping in mind that that is about one thousandth or one tenth of one percent of the annual gross world product. It's nothing. The central problem then of the new century is, in my opinion, how to raise the poor to an endurable quality of life while preserving as much of the natural world as possible with their uh, their uh, help and their enthusiastic support. Both the poor and biological diversity are concentrated in the developing countries. The solution to the problem has to flow on the recognition that both depend on the other. The poor, especially the nearly one billion that are absolutely destitute, have little chance to improve their lives in a devastated environment. And conversely, the natural environments where most of the biodiversity hangs on cannot survive the press of land-hungry people who have nowhere else to go. And a, a conviction shared by growing numbers of thoughtful people in all walks of life is that this problem is enormous and it can be solved. Resources to do it exist. Those who control those resources have a lot of reasons to achieve that goal, not least their own security. In the end, it will be an ethical decision, however, and surely we will find a way to save the integrity of this magnificent planet and the life that it harbors. And to that, I suspect that John Sawhill would have said, Amen. raised two categories of issues. One is the, the practical challenges related to the conservation of biological diversity. And the other one has to do with the, the policy questions of what governments can do and can't do. I would like to invite our panelists to respond and make some contributions to those two issues. Uh, first, I would like to invite Laura Johnson, who is currently the president of the Massachusetts Audubon Society. Laura has extensive experience in practical conservation programs, having worked with the Nature Conservancy, which John Sawhill, in fact, established for 16 years, and currently runs an organization that oversees over 29,000 acres of conservation land and 41 wildlife sanctuaries, and through her, some 250,000 children and adults have access to environmental education. She's a graduate of this university, uh, and as well as the New York 
University and I would like to invite Laura to make some contributions to the discussion. Thank you. Um, well, I first want to say just how honored I am to be here and sharing this stage with this group of people, uh, especially Dr. Wilson, who I've admired for so many years, and also to be able to say something at a lecture honoring John Sahel. As you heard, I worked for the Nature Conservancy for 16 years, and for about half of my years there, John was president. And uh, now that I am the president of my own organization, so to speak, I think about John Sawhill a lot as I try to chart the course for Mass Audubon. And I think of his extraordinary example of leadership, of uh, risk taking, um, and just basically he was just very smart and was, was inspired others to do their very best work. Uh, by his own example, and it's certainly something I try to emulate, and quite frankly, I wish I had had a chance to tell him that uh, and thank him for the mentoring that uh, and the example that he gave me. Um, what I want to focus on a little bit uh, in, in my observations here are uh, in the future of life, um, Dr. Wilson talks a lot about a uh, solution to some of the huge problems which uh, you outlined so effectively uh, around the issue of protecting reserves, protecting land, hotspots. There's a lot of different terms for these depending on the organization and the place and depe depending on whether you're international or domestic. I'm really going to focus primarily on the domestic issues, which I know the best. And the, the model which has worked so well and was really championed by the Nature Conservancy and now has uh, spawned many other organizations, including Conservation International, although I don't know that they'd appreciate the word that they were spawned by TNC. Uh, but certainly the whole land trust movement and so on, all has this basic model, which is that you identify the most important places through a system of inventory, which gets better and better and more and more powerful with the advantage of things like geographic information systems and the data that is more and more available from efforts across the globe, and certainly efforts here in the US. You identify the important places, you work within the system, whether the system is in, the, in Maine or the system is in Suriname, you basically work within the system to ensure as much protection as you possibly can get for them. Um, and then you either take, you take steps of stewardship. You restore them, you restore the ecosystem. If that is, is what is needed, you manage the system. You engage the community, um, and this goes to the point of economic development. You engage the community in the process of visioning what these places will look like. Um, and it's a model that works incredibly well. It's been proven to work well. Uh, it's been proven across the globe to work well. Um, the challenges of it is that, is, first of all, it's, it's very uh, resource intensive. It takes a lot of money to do these kinds of deals. And um, although the conservation movement has been enormously successful in raising money, particularly in the last decade, uh, both from private and public sources, it's still enormously expensive. And it, and it requires that the political will and the financial will remain in place to ensure that those places are, in fact, permanently protected over a long period of time. Um, so the thing that I have been uh, focusing a lot of my attention and the attention of Mass Audubon um, is another issue that Dr. Wilson brings up in the future of life, which is the question of a conservation ethic, the creation of a conservation ethic. Um, and I think in several points in the book, you suggest that uh, a way through the bottleneck is the creation of a conservation ethic that essentially science and technology represent what we can do, but uh, morality is, will determine what we choose to do. And that a conservation ethic, it's dependent on knowledge of, experience with, and love for the land. And in fact, if you'll forgive me, Dr. Wilson, one of my, um, <laughs> one of the many things I love in this book is, uh, in which you say, a conservation ethic is that which aims to pass on to future generations the best part of the non-human world. To know this world is to gain a proprietary attachment to it. To know it well is to love and take responsibility for it. And I think that question is ultimately the long-term solution to the bottleneck. In a world where the culture of consumerism is what drives a lot of the threats to biodiversity, how do we change that? How do we change the fact that uh, for kids today, for many of us, we have very little true contact with the natural world. We have no opportunity to get to know, to know the world well and therefore to love it and therefore to want to preserve it. My 12-year-old uh, son um, and his friends know more names of corporate logos 
than they do the common backyard birds or the tree species in there in, in the neighborhood. Um, they knew all the names of the Pokemon monsters. You're all too old probably to know that. Then, then again, any, any of the common species that are associated um, with where they live, with their sense of place. So how are those children going to gain any conservation ethic in a world that is so fast-paced um, and where they don't really have a chance to roam as you did uh, as a boy and even as I did? Um, so as we think about this question of how to ensure the long-term sustainability and the long-term protection of biodiversity, the thing I'm most focused on and the thing I think we need to pay more attention to, because it's so hard to do, is the question of how to create a conservation ethic. As hard as deals are to do, as hard as it is to identify, and protect, and ensure the permanent protection of, conservation, of reserves, of conservation land, the true long-term sustainability of that solution depends on the political will um, of people who actually care in the long term about these places, who understand them, and who want to preserve them in the long run. And I think that there's an awful lot of directions today that suggest that we're not heading the right way. And so I would pose the question to all of us, how do we do that? How do we make environment more of a, a central question to every single uh, political campaign, to the ways we live our own lives, to the things that we're teaching our children, uh, is rather than uh, have them improve their likelihood of success in entering Harvard by having them have several extracurriculars, why not just take them for a walk in a park? Uh, those seem simple. They don't. They aren't. They aren't grandiose. It isn't a question of uh, as important as it is for those with access to the true corridors of power to make, take advantage of those those accesses, but. The real question is, what's gonna, what are the people going to do in the long term? And how are we going to make it work? Let me now turn to Ian Bowles, who is a senior research fellow at the Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs. Ian left Harvard College in 1987 and since then he has been consistently involved in the environmental movement, working both at the national and the international levels. He served as a legislative assistant in the U.S. House of Representatives and subsequently as vice president for policy for Conservation International. Later he moved on to the White House where he, he served under President Clinton in a variety of capacities, both under the National Security Council and the Council for Environmental Quality. When he's not here at Harvard, which is not a lot of the time, actually, Ian serves as a senior advisor for strategy development for the newly established Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, which was set up recently by the founder of Intel, Gordon Moore. Ian, please. Thank you, Colossus. Um, uh, like Laura, it's a great pleasure to be on a panel with Ed Wilson. Um, and to talk about John Sahil. During my eight years at Conservation International, Ed was the chairman of our program committee of our board of directors, so he used to uh, keep us in line when we were telling our board what we were up to, and John Sahil was someone who was a tremendous partner in, in many of the large-scale governmental efforts and financial efforts to get money flowing out into the conservation field, so it's a tremendous pleasure for me to be here. Um, let me just make a couple comments about uh, the role of private uh, um, conservation organizations and the role of government. For my eight years in the private conservation community and my current work versus uh, some years in the government and the legislative and executive branch, I can unequivocally say that it's the private uh, organizations that are going to make the difference uh, in this field. Uh, we found in the governmental side working on the international treaty process around the conservation of biodiversity that we've had some real substantial challenges. Uh, we have not uh, developed an international governmental consensus around action, uh, and you think that we have problems with the Kyoto Protocol, we, we certainly do, especially in this country, but we've got in, in climate change, but in the area of biodiversity, we haven't been able to build an effective treaty response to the overall question of conservation. We have built successful 
treaty responses to endangered species, trade in endangered species to uh, certain geographic areas, such as Antarctica. But constructing a global regime around conserving biodiversity has been enormously challenging. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, that's one comment. Second is in this question that Ed talked about of, of uh, prioritization and focus, I think it's important to understand that there are a variety of different ecosystems uh, and they each have different um, levels of population around them and different strategies are required. Uh, the so-called hotspot areas that Ed refers to, the Atlantic Forest of Brazil and the island of Madagascar, these are places with tremendous amount of population pressure. Indeed, all of Southeast Asia, uh, just to give you one statistic, uh, has 10 times the population density as tropical South America. So Peninsula Southeast Asia has a much more substantial conservation problem uh, than does South America. And so you need to have different strategies uh, for different places. Um, and, one, and, and I think this gets back to this question of what is the role of sustainable development? What is the role of economic development? I think we need a, a real pragmatism towards concepts like this and we need an ideas that we're going to have a pragmatic approach in, in, in each different place. And then finally, just to add and expand on one point that Ed made in reference uh, in, his, in his talk about um, some of the conservation efforts in these large wilderness areas. Ed and I worked together in Conservation International on a project in Suriname, uh, which turned out to be a lot more simple than we originally thought. We went into doing some, this is a former Dutch Guyana in South America, uh, for those who haven't been to Suriname. Uh, and it's hard to get there, only can fly there three days a week from the U.S. But uh, uh, this is a place that was, in the early 90s, had a series of Malaysian and Indonesian timber companies showing up and seeking large-scale timber concessions, literally concessions that would add up to the size of New Jersey uh, for, uh, for logging. And a set of economic analysis done on these projects showed basically to the government they were going to make about a million dollars a year uh, for logging the size of New Jersey, if you can believe that. Uh, and these are tropical forests with some uh, expensive hardwoods in them. And some of the sort of pragmatic approaches that came out of work on that is essentially going back to the government and saying, instead of making a, a, a sort of quasi-theological argument about the value of biodiversity, uh, let's instead make an economic argument and say, biodiversity can compete, conservation can compete, conservation can pay you that amount of money through an international philanthropic effort, through enhanced tourism, uh, through positive uh, press attention and, and, and things of that nature. So I guess I would sound a note of pragmatism uh, as we think about these issues. Uh, biodiversity is going to be conserved ecosystem by ecosystem uh, around the world and around Massachusetts uh, and it's going to require us to have uh, solutions that have a good deal of flexibility for the circumstance we find themselves in. And I wish I could say more positive about uh, what our government has done. We've done a few things uh, in terms of providing international assistance, helping the international community set up a global fund for conservation, uh, and in these debt for nature swap programs that John Sawhill was a leader in creating, forgiving the United States debt and creating uh, to, to, to developing countries and creating financing programs. Uh, but overall, I think that ultimately the action is going to lie with uh, the many private conservation organizations, such as the one that Laura runs. So thank you. Thank you, Ian. I'll, I'll now turn it to the audience. We have uh, four microphones and very simple rule, which is that you introduce yourself, keep your questions short, and please direct it to a particular individual on the panel. Yes. Um, my name is Vanessa Timmer. I'm a research fellow here at the Kennedy School. And uh, Dr. Wilson, I was struck by what you were saying about how biological diversity uh, relates to what it means to be human. And picking up from what Laura was talking about, about the conservation ethic, um, my question really is, from what do you draw from other cultures or from thinkers in order to form this conservation ethic um, to get us through the bottleneck? If I understand the question correctly, it's what do other cultures than um, Western and particularly American, Western European cultures have to offer in terms of developing a conservation ethic? Is that the question? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not really uh, well prepared to answer that question except perhaps to 
in a general way, except to uh, point out that where on the ground studies have been made of the attitudes of local people to their surrounding environment, particularly those who are uh, living in and around uh, forested areas, uh, rich uh, coastal areas and the like, uh, and have done so sustainably in many cases for thousands of years, there is a, a, a general set of ethical precepts about dealing with the environment and a deep respect for uh, the land and the creatures in it and uh, a desire to, if, uh, to, to save it as it is uh, if they can do so uh, while uh, making, uh, keeping a decent standard of living. It's been very much uh, the case of uh, popul you know, the resulting population growth and uh, the intrusion, I don't want to use that word, the adoption of uh, 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 Western consumption habits that uh, tends to then put pressures on the land, modify them, and run uh, the environments uh, down to a less productive level. Uh, that is the general impression I have, and uh, I'd like to uh, ask, uh, throw this question to, uh, if I, because it's so important to uh, uh, Dr. Juma, what do you think about that? Oh, wow. <laughs> well, <laughs> I thought I was moderating that. <laughs> you, uh, I, I, I'd like you to do that because you've had a lot of experience in the areas where it's most important. I actually thought you were going to say we can learn from the ants. <laughs> 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 but I, I'm happy to return to, to this question, but let's get a right. question from you. <laughs> um, my name is Dak Lisko. I'm a sophomore at the college and a member of the Environmental Action Committee. I have a problem for Professor Wilson. Um, although you didn't mention this specifically in your speech, it's well recognized that global climate change is one of the greatest threats to global biodiversity through shifting habitats and like that. Um, and despite this threat, here we are standing and Harvard, a huge producer of um, greenhouse gases. Um, I read your book this summer and was inspired. And now I hope that you're willing to inspire academics at Harvard and other universities. Will you, right now, cha <laughs> challenge President Summers to do what the presidents of Tufts and other universities have already done and commit Harvard to meet or beat Kyoto's, Kyoto's greenhouse gas reduction goals? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Now, this, this, your answer to this will be the response to the conservation ethic question. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I, uh, I, I, you know, I'm not. I haven't been hardened into the uh, kind of environment that. Uh, prevails here in the Kennedy School, so I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I, let me see if I can finesse the answer and get you to sit down. Not... <laughs> <laughs> By saying uh, that Harvard uh, has the position, it's, it's ready, it has the position, it has the stature, it has the resources to be a world leader at every level in bringing the global environment uh, onto center stage. And uh, I just hope it will. I think uh, President Summers is a very bright man with a very broad mind. Okay, on to another subject. Um, my name is Sasha Littman. I'm a joint uh, student uh, in business and public policy here at the Kennedy School. Uh, my focus is on uh, developing uh, quantitative tools to help uh, nonprofits become more effective. Um, this question is directed towards the panelists based on a comment uh, that, uh, that uh, Dr. Wilson made. Uh, you had stated that uh, we're really looking at biodiversity and natural resources as a source of income, and that's the way we've been looking at it for many years. Now, given the capitalist game that, we're, game that we're playing in, one way to respond to that is to acquire and purchase land um, in biodiverse or hot spots around the world. Um, another possible strategy, I'm wondering why this hasn't been as explored, could be to 
assign the biodiverse areas and land areas around the world uh, actually capital asset values that would enable uh, poor countries that may be not wealthy in terms of economy uh, but yet have great biodiversity would allow them to put onto their balance sheets um, a huge amount of, of their assets and once the world would recognize that asset, uh, those assets would really give them an, a chance to compete in this global economy. I'm just wondering why that, this question of capitalizing the biodiversity assets hasn't been really tackled. Ian, I think you have to Well, I mean, I think it, it gets to um, a number of problems. Uh, one, I'd say that the, the Convention on Biodiversity really, in some ways, tried to capture that by saying that, enshrining in international law, that a country of origin for a given species of piece of genetic code would benefit from the industrial application of it elsewhere. Essentially, the treaty established that. The idea being the, the case of the rosy periwinkle from Madagascar that forms the basis, genetic basis for the treatment of Hodgkin's disease, uh, and that Madagascar didn't get any money from that uh, commercialization. Um, but I think what we found in this problem is that ultimately, biodiversity values uh, for a variety of reasons that Theo could explain better than I could don't, uh, don't aggregate up to end up being worth much. Uh, the, uh, one of the classic examples is that ecosystem services like clean water uh, end up not being priced in a way uh, that lead to the conservation of, the, of that resource. So you've ended up with, and you don't see pharmaceutical companies willing to put up money up front for the conservation of a given rainforest area because the marginal value of a given unknown species of plant uh, ends up being pretty close to zero based on you know, economic analysis. So you've ended up with a lot of rhetoric around ideas like that and a lot of uh, activity and effort. But ultimately, uh, I think a lot of those discussions that came from the Rio process 10 years ago on to the present you started to see a little bit of a movement back towards the older ideas of thinking about parks uh, and just saying that we don't need to make the argument that this biodiversity will just pay for itself, just let it sit and someone will come, you know, make use of it and it will accrue to your value uh, in your country. Uh, I think you've seen a movement back towards conservationists sort of saying, well, you know, what's the next alternative land use worth uh, logging that area, putting mining in that area, and can conservation uh, and conservationists come up with funds to, to compete with that. But I'd, I'd encourage you to talk to Theo about it. He'll, uh, he can tell you a lot more than I can. Could we? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Santiago Enriquez. I am a master in public policy here at Kennedy School. Uh, my question goes to Professor uh, Wilson. Um, you stated that um, a large large ecosystems could be conserved with a relative small amount of money, yet um, where that money will come from is, is yet to be answered. Um, some attempts have been made to put prices to environmental services, and you know Costa Rica, for instance, was successful in, in trading uh, carbon bonds. Uh, do you see an increase in the commercialization of environmental services, a, a real option, and do you think that's a potential source of income for conservation activities? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Is it, is it that, uh, that by putting some kind of measure on ecosystem services, uh, we can make the argument for uh, protecting uh, the, uh, the, uh, the agents that create it for us? Is that what you're saying? Um, what I'm saying is, um, can we pay people just to keep forests so that the forest will um, take the carbon from the atmosphere? Can we pay people to conserve? Um, oh, yes. Yeah. Well, that's, that's exactly what we want to do. I, I, I mean, the, uh, the whole point of the conservation concessions, which again was described by uh, uh, Ian Bowles, uh, is that uh, that can be done very effectively uh, from uh, private funding uh, even today uh, and uh, by a redirection of a very small amount of, uh, uh, of annual uh, payouts available for environment from uh, organizations like the United Nations and the World Bank. And uh, I think one of the most compelling arguments of all is to keep in mind that a uh, team of economists and biologists in 1997 
made an effort, uh, you know, not entirely unchallenged, but it was nevertheless persuasive to calculate the total value, annual value of the uh, ecosystem services of the natural environment worldwide, and that figure was 33 trillion in 1997. That's more than the gross world product. Uh, but then there are fine examples to look to uh, when you come to practical exemplars of this in uh, local situations. One of the more dramatic is the discovery by the city of New York upon a, a very simple economic analysis uh, that its water supply in the, uh, uh, in the Catskill Mountains famed for its purity for generations uh, was, uh, and was deteriorating, uh, could be replenished and, the, and saved uh, by um, saving the forest of the Catskill, you know, which is the watershed, as opposed to uh, building a uh, filtration plant for uh, many times that amount. I think we'll find a lot of examples kind of, kind of, you know, coming out of greater recognition of ecosystem services and the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the opportunities that a little bit of inventive thinking uh, will provide us. Thank you. Lou? Uh, Louis Branscombe, Professor Emeritus. The, it may be possible with financial incentives to persuade governments to refrain from uh, inappropriately exploiting uh, the resources that they have, <clears throat> but three quarters of the world is covered with water and most of that water is not owned by any one country. Uh, so my question has to do with the like, whether you can be as optimistic about a regime which will establish enforceable regulations of what goes on in the oceans. And I'll just cite you the one example that bothers me, uh, which is that in the Southern Ocean, uh, the fishing is done with 80 miles of baited hooks, which during the day catch, uh, are now decimating half of the species of albatross on the earth. If they keep it up, they'll be gone. Uh, all it takes is to persuade them to fish at night instead of in the daytime, and it solves the problem. But there's no regulatory authority to make that happen. How can we establish some kind of global authority to preserve what goes on in the open oceans? Do you want to take on? What, what interests me about the question, I, I honestly don't know how we establish a global authority to take on the oceans. I think it's sort of the tragedy of the commons writ large in many ways. I also think that um, it goes back to this question of what is the consumer willing to put up with? And if you look at things like the, the current um, campaign to have Chilean sea bass, for example, banned, um, because part of the fishery of the Chilean sea bass fishery is that it's not only getting decimating the fish, but it has um, that it has impact on other um, pelagic bird species and so on. So, if the consumer will say no, as we did in this country about dolphin safe tuna, then you then you have a market regulation. You have a market demand regulation to the to the. Um, standards and practices of the industry, which in some ways is more effective. The problem is it doesn't happen very fast. Um, and it takes this sort of education of the consumer to, you know, to be able to have that immediate, that immediate effect. As far as the regulation of the seas go, I would defer to, to those who do international conservation more than I about what could be effective. We certainly don't have a, a good example, I don't think, out there. Yeah, do you have well, I mean, I, I guess I, I just to add that we have, we've had a bunch of problems with some of the international treaty process. I'm sure you're familiar with the law of the sea and some of the objections about deep seabed mining that the United States had that got fixed, and we still haven't agreed to participate in the treaty. Um, and uh, uh, so we, we have developed some niche successes in certain areas. I mean, some of the response to the WTO is uh, cases around turtles have been to develop regional cooperation efforts around turtles and you've seen some limited successes in the uh, in the southern ocean around Antarctica we have got uh, proposals for whale sanctuaries things of that nature but um, I don't know that anyone knows exactly what the answer of how to get a you know a successful global regime on the high seas uh, there are some little niche treaties about uh, highly migratory 
uh, fish species and all that. Um, Colestis might have an answer. I should check it back to our moderator, who, by the way, used to be the executive director of the conservation of the Convention on Biological Diversity of the UN, and is a far more experienced uh, biodiplomat than I am. So, Colestis. I. I... <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to trade places? This is not fair at all. Uh, I have two questions that I have to answer at the end of this. Uh, that's let's go over there. Yes, thank you. I'm Dr. Michael Charney. I'm co-chairman of the Massachusetts Climate Action Network. I'd like to ask the panel, uh, what's been described seems to be a Noah's Ark theory of preserving biodiversity. And I'm wondering, in the absence of a major energy transition, uh, if we maintain the course that the Cheney Energy Plan uh, is forecasting and the one the United States and the West has, West, particularly the United States, has been following. What is the likely impact of climate change per se on the uh, hot spots and on the other precious areas? And how will the international conservation community address that part of the threat? Uh, this was uh, the impact on the, what was the word? The impact of climate change on the Biodiversity. Oh, okay. Generally, and, I thought the, you used the word there. Can we do it? Catch. Can we do it in the absence of energy transition? Uh, no. Uh, the uh, you know the impact is uh, uh, is, is enormous, and uh, but we uh, tend to uh, in in global conservation to policy to look at the brush fires. We, you know we can handle those. But we recognize, uh, because they are, that's, those are taking place over a period of just a few years, the global uh, the climate change is going to uh, exact its uh, great toll over a period of several decades. So it's, research is going on on that, and uh, solutions are being talked about. We know already that um, the polar uh, ecosystems are at risk even within the next few years. And we know particularly of the Gondwanan lands along the southern, the, the rim of the southern hemisphere, uh, the southern continents are next in line. For example, the, uh, the great flora, floristic region of South Africa. Uh, and I, I don't know of any solution other than trying to slow the, uh, the rate of global warming. This ought to be a major consideration in any discussion with global Warming. That uh, we ought to, uh, be, you know, there's, there's another major argument for moving as rapidly as possible as we can to eliminate uh, carbon-based energy and uh, and uh, the uh, increase of, green, of greenhouse gas production. I'll take the last two questions, one over there and the last one over here. Uh, I, hi, my name is Kerry Johnson, a recent graduate of the School of Public Health here. Uh, I, my, one of my concerns is that uh, the whole issue of conserving pristine uh, ecosystems is going to become a luxury good in the world, particularly as we lend it towards uh, market mechanisms. And what, and I'm sure you've observed this, what that can mean is that the Western world will continue to benefit from pristine environments while people without will continue to be without, I mean, not the least of which might be environmental refugees and people who actually are displaced from their properties for, and for the sake of conservation. And I was wondering if you can maybe talk to some of that. How can we, as we proceed with a conservation ethic, how can we be sure to bring everybody along so it doesn't be just increase the disparity between the haves and have-nots? Thanks. Laura? Well, I think it's a great question, and I think part of it is this uh, trend in the, in the notion of pristine. Um, I would challenge you on, on, on that being the overriding uh, determinant or, or standard that is trying to be achieved in a lot of these reserve areas. In fact, one of the changes in the last decade in the whole way we think about protecting land, yeah, we do want to protect the hot spots of biodiversity, but increasingly we want to do it through this sort of community-based conservation. There's a lot of different words for it, but involving the community, involving the stakeholders, involving um, indigenous peoples in the solutions to maintaining biodiversity. And uh, biodiversity actually is, can be very resilient. Um, and can tolerate, uh, in some cases, some use, development, uh, extraction. It all depends on sort of how you do it and how much you do it. And so, so I'm not, um, I wouldn't leap to the conclusion that the, the 
the, the solution we're all advocating is pristine natural areas that exclude uh, any use or any, um, you know, the, the ability of humans to continue to interact in that ecosystem. Would you agree? I would agree. Let me add one thing to that class, if I might. I uh, just to speak up on behalf of Laura's organization a little bit here in Massachusetts, by the way, the largest private landowner in the state. Uh, I think that uh, Mass Audubon has tried to uh, create reserves within 20 or 30 minutes, is that right, of every resident of the Commonwealth. This is a pretty populated state, as certainly compared to Western uh, parts of the United States. And I do think that there is an element where you're right about pristine areas being truly pristine, wilderness values, you gotta pay a lot of money to try to get out there and participate and go camping and fly and do all that kind of stuff. But there is certainly a uh, urban environmental you know, conservation ethic that I think uh, you know, organizations like Laura's bridge that gap from uh, urban daily recreational use of nature, uh, but also having some of the larger ecosystems that uh, are more pristine. The last question over there, please. Hi. Um, my name is Samantha Bolton, and I'm, I've been working here at the Kennedy School on HIV and mobilization for access to medicines. And my question is about the role of activists and NGOs in this whole thing, because, it, I mean, as we've seen from the whole AIDS issue, and even from Save the Whales before, that when activists get together and really push, they can really move agendas. And it seems that one of the problems with the environmental movement now is that it's not sexy. It's no longer catching the public imagination. You know, it's AIDS, there's Seattle, there's other issues and in a way it's almost as if they've just become a bunch of policy wonks working on their own little thing and that you know meanwhile the Brazilian forest is being destroyed and no one's getting together nobody's doing anything and so I'm just wondering how much of this failure is due to the lack of an ability to mobilize and move the hearts and minds I'll take a crack at that if you want. I, uh, I mean, speaking of defending uh, Ed and Colossus and Laura, I think you know conservation is pretty sexy out here. Um, <laughs> the, uh, no, I, uh, I mean, in truth, I think uh, I turn it back to you in a little bit. I mean, I think the HIV campaign is a case where the world sat on its hands for you know a decade before heads of state started to get involved. Um, I think in the environmental area, you've got 100 years of conservation activism, starting with Teddy Roosevelt on down through the ages, where a lot of progress has been made about conservation. And I think a lot of the NGO uh, criticisms of the WTO and the World Bank and others came from the environmental movement, uh, first and foremost, where the environmental uh, cause has been something that has led to a lot of the transparency reforms in the international institutions. And so, uh, and I would say that in the internet age, that uh, advocacy is of tremendous value and importance that there is no longer a place to hide for a, a misbehaving mining company or timber company uh, and you've really seen an explosion in the last 10 years of, of uh, information flow uh, around that. Now I do think that in, in today's day and age post September 11th and the discussion of Iraq that you know issues that I'd like to see on the headlines of you know, why we're not doing more about climate change or why we're not paying attention to Highland Papua New Guinea, uh, you know, they do fall behind. I think that occurs to, to, the, to the AIDS campaign as well. So I guess I would say advocacy is great uh, and it, uh, uh, it helps bring a lot of these issues, uh, issues to the fore. Although I do think that field conservation organizations like, like Laura's and others are, you know, the key players are actually gonna be out there helping a gov underfunded government to actually conserve, you know, some of these places around the world. You know, I want to add just to that quick, if I may. Tom Friedman has made the excellent case in uh, his book, uh, Alexis and the Olive Tree, that the, uh, the internet revolution is going to be an extremely powerful and welcome addition to global conservation. Because the information flows so readily and instantly about anything going on in the uh, world of uh, exploitation, natural resources, and conservation efforts, and so on. And a spotlight can be put almost immediately on some place where the uh, invasion uh, and, and the, the conversion is going on uh, of a particularly egregious nature. The example he, uh, he cited was uh, how uh, the uh, takeover of a large part of the Pantanal, which is a kind of a super Everglades of southern Brazil, was halted by the internet. You know, that, uh, the information that was spread around so quickly immediately brought forces to bear, economic, uh, 
uh, uh, moral uh, and uh, generally a, alarm over the loss of uh, a great resource of this sort for Brazil. The, the two questions that were passed on to me, I, th I think the ethics one, the, the environmental ethic one, I think has been adequately addressed. Uh, the oceans question, I think there is now sufficient evidence to show that those treaties that have worked happen to be areas where you can establish a very clear baseline from a scientific and technical point of view. And second, you have effective mechanism for ver verification and feedback so that when violations are conducted, you can actually pick that up and act on it as quickly as possible. And this tends to limit the scope of where you operate. That's why the, the niche treaties have been more effective than the large scale ones. But I think we are going to see a new generation of treaties based on, say, satellite imagery and GIS information that in fact are going to be probably effective on a larger scale. Uh, and I believe that that's the direction that that in fact, uh, international environmental law is going to go. It's going to follow where the technologies are actually advancing. And then if you combine that with the internet, where you have public responses to incidents, then it becomes possible to enforce uh, some of these treaties on a slightly larger scale than the two now, uh, and a few, a few niche ones. So I wanted to invite you all to really give a big hand to uh, E.O. Wilson and our contributors.